I was so glad to see that this was how we worked. And you know, you think about it, we really bit off an impossible thing. We're supposed to like write and learn and perform new songs all in the period of like about a month or something. So um, <laughs> it was like, strictly speaking, a little bit impossible. Hello friends, it's Mike Williams. With this presentation, I'm going to take everyone through an overview of why I concluded, based on my research, that the Beatles did not write all their own music or play on all of their recorded tracks, especially between the periods of 1962 through 1966. And I think this will be helpful to all of the new subscribers that have come to the channel over the last few months. So to get started, what I'm going to do is to play two clips where Paul McCartney drops truth bombs. And the first one is from June of 1966. It was a press conference at the Hilton in Japan. And in this clip, Paul says, we're not very good musicians and we never claim to be. We're adequate, but not very good. So let's take a listen to what Paul tells us. Uh, how highly would you rate your own music? We don't rate it. We don't sort of compare it and classify it like everybody else. Yeah. Well, we're not we're not very good musicians, you know, and we never claim to be very good musicians. We're, we're adequate, but not very good. Well, what's the reason do you think for the uh, tremendous popularity? Is it because well, people admire your talent, or well, I don't know. You know, maybe they re uh, <coughs> admire adequate music. Yeah. Okay, so that's clip number one, and again, we heard Paul say that they are not very good musicians. They never claim to be. They're adequate, but not very good. I could make an argument that not very good and adequate are not synonymous. And at the end, when he says that, well, maybe people like adequate music, some might say that, well, he's just being cheeky there. Now, I, I think what he was doing was trying to close down the line of questioning. That's my personal opinion. Okay, but the, the key piece of this is him admitting that they are not very good musicians. Now the second clip, which I'm going to play in a moment, it's about five minutes long. It took place August 5th of 1966. It's the same day that Revolver was released and Paul and John are being interviewed by the BBC. So two months after the June press conference at the Hilton in Japan, they do this interview with the BBC. And Paul, again, drops bombshells. We're going to hear him say that we don't write between LPs normally, maybe one or two. And because Paul phrased it as maybe one or two, that number could also be zero songs being written between LPs. And then he goes on to say that they wrote in great big batches, which is the rubber soul situation. And then he continues by saying that they are limited as a group and we're the first to say we're not all that good musically. At the end of this clip, you're going to hear Paul McCartney say that the Beatles, including himself, didn't have to show up in the studio for the recording of the song yesterday. And he says, we didn't have to play. We didn't have to show ourselves up again. And by saying it the way he said it, we didn't have to show ourselves up again infers that there were other times when they didn't have to show up to record a song. Now, what's interesting about this is Paul McCartney is credited with playing the acoustic guitar on the song yesterday. So if he didn't have to show and he wasn't there, the logical question is, who's playing guitar on the song yesterday? So this clip is about five minutes in length. I extracted it out of the larger interview, which is about 20, 25 minutes. I'll put the link down in the description box if you want to watch the entire interview. So let's take a listen. I did upload this video to my channel, so some of you may have seen it, but it's well worth taking a look at again. Let's continue on. John, when you started out and, and, and became the Beatles as a group, you were then writing songs with Paul. Did you at that time have as your goal, your ambition to be a successful group, or did you really think it was songwriting that mattered? Uh, it, was, it was the group thing mainly at first, because uh, any way to get, sell the songs, you, you can't sort of get 
You know, you've got to send them to some little publisher otherwise. You know, who never looks at them. So we, we, all, we always concentrated on the group, really. Now, let me just pause here for a moment. If we go back to the 1982 documentary, The Complete Beatles, which was considered at the time the documentary on the Beatles until Anthology was released, we're told, and I've presented this many times, that Paul McCartney and John Lennon, either separately or together, collaborating, wrote 100 songs between them from 1956 through 1962. The Complete Beatles also says that none of those songs were recorded. So to me, that sounds a bit convenient, but be that as it may. And we also have to remember that back in 1956, Paul McCartney was 14 years old and John was 16. So two guys in their mid-teens start writing a bunch of songs, 100 over a period of six years, according to the Complete Beatles. And, as I've also presented, a problem arises in that we really can't find those 100 songs anywhere, right up to the point where the Beatles meet George Martin. And I'm going to take you through some George Martin quotes in a bit. Did you at any one stage come to the point where you said, heavens above, we're, we're successful as composers and we shall be more successful as composers than we'll ever be as musicians? I can't remember a point, but I know it's, there is some sort of, must have been some time when it suddenly dawned on us, but I can't remember it. So this is an interesting comment by John, because he's being asked, was there a point in time when you realized that you were songwriters and composers? more than just four guys in a band. And John essentially says that he doesn't know when that moment was, which is intriguing to me because as I just mentioned, between 1956 and 1962, we're told that they wrote 100 songs. And now it's August 5th, 1966, the same day that Revolver was released. That's when this BBC interview was conducted. The Beatles are credited with 77 original compositions on their first seven albums. So between Please Please Me and Revolver, 77 original Beatles compositions. So we tack that on to the 100 alleged songs that they wrote between 56 and 62. Now we have 100 and 77 songs. Then we have to add another 12 songs on top of that because there were official singles that were released that were not album tracks. So that gets us to 189 songs. And the 189 does not include songs that were told that they gave away. The three songs that were on the Decca demo, the three original songs. So the number is greater than 189. So that level of writing would be considered prolific. And he's in an interview on the same date that their seventh studio album is released. So they have seven official releases under their belt. And he doesn't know at what point they consider themselves to be songwriters and composers more than just four guys in a band. Now, the question I asked myself as I was listening to this dialogue, and I will pose the question to the audience as well, is why wasn't John definitive in his response? Why didn't he say, we realized that we were songwriters and composers and really good ones at this point? Now, I know there are people that are watching this presentation and they're going to say, well, he was just being humble. Was he? Or did he respond the way he did because he knows that the Beatles' backstory with regard to their songwriting abilities is fictional. Let's continue on. Well, in fact, when you are faced with a situation of having to turn something out, do you then try running over phrases on a guitar that have been going through your mind for some time, seeing what you can Yeah, we, yeah that's another trick, to, to, <laughs> to try some, an old song, yes. you know, one that never quite made it, and take a bit out of it that was, wasn't bad. In other words, and try and make yeah, and try and make that into a song. Yes. 
Do, do you t store away in your minds odd phrases that you hear from time to time that will make a good title? Well, I think I try to, but I always forget them. If they're stored away in my mind, they might come back without me knowing. Yes. There's bits from other records I think I'll pinch that, and I'll never remember it. Well, you jumped in very quickly there, John. Does this mean that you're the words expert in particular? No. You know, it's, <laughs> I find it just as hard words or music. So, with this exchange, John and Paul are explaining that the songwriting process is exactly that. It's a process. It's not this spontaneous, on-demand activity. And songwriting takes time, and it can be challenging. You both have to be in the right mood when you, you, you're working together, collaborating on a song. Yeah. Does one have to wait for the other to... Uh, to very start? seldom, you know. If we both don't feel like it, we just have another ciggy. And if, if, if one does, does, does the other say, well, well wait till next week? The only time we've got to do that, when we've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it, is when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a, bit, it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to... You know, in fact, the last LP. <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know. So this is interesting, right? So Paul's explaining that songwriting takes time, and he then goes on to say that with the last LP, it took weeks to get one song written. Now, I'm assuming when he talks about the last LP, he's referring to Revolver because this interview, as I mentioned earlier, is taking place on August 5th, 1966, which is the same day that Revolver was released. So if it took them weeks to get one song written for Revolver, then how did they get 16 songs done in 30 days for Rubber Soul? Think about that. And to get back into the swing of it, because we don't write in between, uh, in between LPs normally maybe just write sort of one or two this is a bombshell admission and i'll talk more about it in a bit and then we have a great big batch because we don't write in between uh in between lps normally maybe just write sort of one or two and then we have a great big batch i thought it was quite impossible really to say right we've got to write 12 songs for an lp let's settle down to it it is some days on this last time was very impossible because the, I don't know, you get, holiday spirit. Mm, you know, the sun shining and, well, it was at the time. In so fact, we tried uh, writing them in the garden then, mm. and then you forget about it, start looking at flowers and trees and things like that, really. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a bombshell revelation coming from Paul McCartney. And why is that? Because in one fell swoop, Paul completely destroys the argument that the official narrative puts forth, and that so many Beatle fans believe that the reason why the Beatles were able to write as many songs as they did during their tenure as a band is because the Beatles were writing music every waking moment of their life. We have all heard the stories. The Beatles were writing when they were on tour. We're told that the Beatles were writing music on the sets of their films. For those of you who follow my work, you know I presented an interview where John Lennon admitted that during the filming of Help, they were in a haze of marijuana. And the director of the film, Richard Lester, really couldn't do anything with them beyond midday because they were stoned. So if they couldn't film and get their lines down, what would make anybody think that they were sitting there writing music? And then we have John and Paul explaining that when they had their downtime, as an example, the time off they had after a concert tour. So if we go back to Rubber Soul, before they came into the studio on October 11th, 1965, they had a U.S. tour. And it was 16 shows that went right across the U.S. from the East Coast to the West Coast. 16 shows in two weeks. So essentially, a show a day. And once that tour completed on August 31st, they came home. And a lot of people want to make the argument that that's when the Beatles wrote the songs for Rubber Soul, the six week period of time before they entered the studio on October 11th of 65. But the problem with that argument is 
it is not supported by the official narrative. The Beatles' official narrative states, the Beatles came into the Rubber Soul Sessions on October 11th of 1965 with essentially no backlog of music. And I'll get into more of this when I touch on Scott Fryman's work and Mark Lewison and what Mark says in his book, but we'll get there in a moment. So not only is the argument that the Beatles wrote the songs for Rubber Soul during their holiday leading into the Rubber Soul sessions, not supported by the official narrative, it's not supported by the Beatles themselves. Because we just heard John and Paul explain that they were not motivated or inclined to write music when they were on holiday, during their downtime. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. They were on tour going across the United States from the East Coast to the West Coast, as I explained before, 16 shows in 15 days. They come home, and do we seriously think that they're going to get right down to business, start writing songs, start rehearsing? No, it doesn't make any sense. They came back from that tour, this whirlwind tour, exhausted. So they had six weeks to relax and recharge before they head into the Rubber Soul Sessions to learn and record the vocals. Let's continue on. I guess he gives you some ideas when you're recording your songs. Do you give him any ideas on his recordings of your Sometimes songs? we go along to the sessions, you know. B gives us more ideas than we give him, I think. So they're talking about George Martin. Because he's at all of our sessions and we're not at all of his. In fact, I think I've been to one. Did, did you get any particular interest out of the uh, the bigger lineup that was available to him? Oh yes, yeah. It's uh, the only the only trouble, the main trouble with having big lineups and things is you use session men, and session men are all great technically, but you've got to write exactly what you want out on paper for session men, and so it's easier with us because you can sort of say to George, no, not that, uh, a bit more like so and so, uh, and you know, and he'd do it didn't know what you meant. So what Paul is saying here is that session men are like robots. <laughs> so if you needed something done on a song, you had to write it out. They were incapable of improvising. His explanation here rings hollow. These guys, if you asked them to do something, they were able to do it. Trust me. You said to a session man, no, uh, you know, do it a bit like sort of, uh, you know, well, then he'd, he'd need it written down. So that's the only big trouble, really, with uh, doing it with big bands. You've got, to, you've got to know exactly how to write. And it's very difficult to, to write bending notes and things on instruments. You know, you can't... Uh, and so that's why sometimes the versions by other people can sound a bit square occasionally. Paul's improvising here. It doesn't make any sense, at least to me. First of all, like I said, Vic Flick... Big Jim Sullivan, Glenn Campbell, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton. These guys are extraordinary guitar players. So if you have a Vic Flick or a Big Jim Sullivan in the studio and you're looking for a guitar bend, they're not going to turn around and say, gee, I don't know how to do that unless you give me the sheet music. These guys can do this stuff in their sleep. They're seasoned session players. So what Paul's talking about here. It may make sense to the layperson, somebody who's not musically inclined, but it's simply not true. Okay, so let's continue on here. Yesterday took the uh, listening public a bit of surprise, I think. It's a bit of a shock to them. You have since then recorded some more with an unusual instrumentation in the backing. Mm. Um, was this inspired by the success of yesterday, or did you do it because you liked it? Well, the, the, see, the... Uh, the idea for yesterday of doing it like that was because um, we, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. We, see, we're, we're limited as a group. You know, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway, musically. So here we have Paul restating what he said two months prior at the press conference in Japan, where he said, we're not very good musicians. And we never claim to be. We're adequate, but not very good. And 
Here, in this interview, August 5, 1966, he's telling us that the Beatles are limited as a group, and they're the first to say that they are not all that good musically. So Paul McCartney's own assessment of the band's skill level, stating that they are not very good musicians, and they never said that they were, and that they are limited as a group, creates a problem for the official narrative around Rubber Soul. It doesn't support the narrative around Rubber Soul. Because the official story around the album says that the Beatles came into the studio on October 11th, 1965 with essentially no backlog of music. I've taken you through this before, which means they had to write, learn, and when I say learn, what I mean by that is if John and Paul were writing music, they then had to take that song that they wrote and they had to show it to George and Ringo so that they can learn it. And once they all understood the structure of the song, then they could rehearse it. And with rehearsal comes changes. So the arrangement of the song could very well change. And then they continue to rehearse it until they have it down to the point where they feel comfortable to record it. So write, learn, rehearse, arrange, and record. 16 songs in 30 days. And if you're one of these people that likes to create their own narrative around Rubber Soul, and you have convinced yourself that the Beatles came in with four or five songs already written, then pick a number. 10 songs in 30 days, 12 songs in 30 days, 14. It doesn't matter. Because the task at hand, whether it's 10 songs or 16 songs, is monumental. Even if you brought in crack songwriters and you told them, look, we're starting from scratch here. We need 16 songs in 30 days. They would look at you like, what are you, nuts? And of course, you'd have to have the studio players right there. As soon as the songs are written, the studio guys bang it out. But a 30-day window to get 10 to 16 songs done is not realistic. And we'll talk more about this in some upcoming slides. So let's finish up this clip and let's take a listen to what else Paul has to say. Oh, and by the way, as Paul is discussing all this, we don't hear a peep out of John Lennon. Lennon is not saying, hold on, Paul, you're wrong. We're not just adequate. We're the best. We don't hear anything out of John. So John's silence throughout this is very, very telling. So the wisdom of like yesterday, the best we could have done with it would have been uh, This Boy or If I Fell. You know, those are sort of, I think, two of mm -hmm. the best that we've done like that with a group and still managed to put the song over in the way it should have been. But with yesterday, uh, it would have just meant either another If I Fell or another This Boy, you know, another Beatles combo doing a slow one, you know. So um, we did it like that, and nobody seemed to mind, at least of all us, I think, you know, because we didn't have to play, we didn't have to show ourselves up again <laughs> on record. So Paul admits that they didn't have to show, including himself, for yesterday, and they didn't have to record. If you want, you can rewind the video and take another listen to it, but that's exactly what he said. And as I mentioned earlier, before I started this clip, Paul is credited with playing the acoustic guitar on Yesterday. So, if he didn't have to show, then who put the guitar track down? We've got to do that. We've got to actually sort of force ourselves to write it. It's when we've got an LP coming up or we've yes. got a film coming up or something. And uh, then it's a, bit, it's a bit of a drag for the first, say, two songs, because you really got to... Why would two naturally gifted songwriters have to force themselves to write music. It'll be, <laughs> wow, we took weeks just trying to get one written, you know, to get back into the swing. It took them weeks to get one song written. Think about that, weeks. Rubber Soul was, let's just round it out, four weeks. Paul is saying it took weeks to get one song done. We don't write in between, uh, in between LPs, normally. Again, 
this to me is the most significant part of the interview because by Paul saying that they did not write songs between LPs normally, maybe one or two, and maybe can also mean zero songs were written between LPs, Paul single-handedly blows up the official narrative. Because the official narrative says that the reason why the Beatles were able to write as many songs as they did is because they were a perpetual motion machine. They were always writing songs. They were writing songs when they were on tour, they were writing songs when they were on film sets, and they were writing songs when they had their downtime, when they were on holiday. Here are my takeaways from the previous segment, the BBC interview that took place on August 1st of 1966. So the first question, generally speaking, is songwriting a spontaneous exercise or activity? And from what we heard from John and Paul, the answer is no. Can songwriting be challenging? And again, from what we heard, yes. Does it take time to write songs? Yes. However, in the BBC interview, and hopefully you picked up on this, there are two threads regarding the songwriting that contradict each other. The first thread is John and Paul telling us that writing songs takes time and can be challenging. And then Paul tells us when they were forced to write songs, they did so by writing in great big batches as they were heading into the studio. If you're going to write in great big batches and forced to write, you're writing the music within a specific parameter of time. So when you're operating within a finite window of time, you have to move quickly. You can't take your time. You can't dilly-dally because you have a due date. You're being told, hey, you've got to get 10, 12, 14, 16 songs written because we've got to get an album out by this date. So you've got to move fast. And when this happens, you're under the gun. There's stress. And there's always the possibility that your creative engine is not firing on all eight cylinders on a particular day. Maybe you have writer's block. For those of you who are listening and are songwriters, you know how this works. Sometimes you'll sit down and say, hey, I'm going to write a song. And you're at your piano or you're playing your guitar. And you decide after a period of time, you know, this is not working. So I'll give it another go tomorrow or another day. So again, two contradictory threads taking place in that BBC interview. One is telling us that it takes time to write music. It's a process. It can be difficult. And then the other thread is, hey, when we were forced to write, we write the songs in great big batches within a specific window of time. And that's how we did it. Well, those two explanations don't reconcile, in my opinion. Were the Beatles familiar with session players? And the answer is yes, because we heard the BBC interviewer ask Paul and John if they were familiar with the larger lineup that was available to George Martin. And the reason why I included this question is because I had a sense that the BBC interviewer was a little suspect on some of the dialogue that was taking place. The first time was when Paul said that they wrote in great big batches. And the interviewer said, well, I always thought it was quite impossible to write 12 songs for an album. And then he asked the question about their awareness of the larger lineup available to George Martin, which would be the session players. And I'm thinking, is he suspicious that there's more to it than just the Beatles in the studio? It was just a thought that I had, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe this guy was wondering to himself, I, I don't know about this. I'm not so sure what you guys are telling me here is the full scoop. And then Paul goes on to paint the studio players as mechanical musicians that have an inability to improvise. And the only way you can get them to play a certain piece or a certain note or a certain bend is to write it out for them which is untrue. It's actually, it's ridiculous. And then he goes on to say something else that's not true when he says that 
it's difficult to annotate guitar bends, and that's not the case at all. Next question, did Paul play on yesterday? And the answer is no. And that's because Paul told us that the Beatles, including himself, did not play on a song. In fact, the quote is, we didn't have to play, we didn't have to show ourselves up again on record. I think that's pretty clear. He's telling us that they and he were not on the recording of yesterday. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, he's credited with playing the acoustic guitar on the song. So let's take a look now at the next three questions. Did the Beatles write songs between albums? The answer is no. Paul told us in the BBC interview that they did not write songs between albums normally, maybe one or two, and maybe could also mean zero. And again, this is very significant because by Paul saying this, he destroys the official narrative, which tells us that the Beatles were writing music all the time, like they were a perpetual motion machine, just cranking out songs all the time, heads down, every waking moment of their life. And in one fell swoop, in one interview, Paul McCartney tells everybody that that story is not true. So that leads us to the next question, which is really answered by the first question, did the Beatles write songs when on holiday? And the answer has to be no, because their holidays were between albums. And with Paul telling us that they did not write songs between albums, then they weren't writing songs when they were on holiday. And if we go back to the BBC interview, Paul and John were saying that when they had their downtime, they were not inclined or motivated to write songs. They were outside, the sun is out, the trees look beautiful, the birds are singing, and so they had another smoke, and they went about their day doing other stuff other than writing songs. And it makes sense when you think about it because their holidays were typically after they got done touring. So if we go back to the Rubber Soul story, the tour right before coming into Rubber Soul was their U.S. tour in August, the latter part of August, the last two weeks of August of 1965, where they did 16 cities in 15 days. That's a whirlwind tour, and it is exhausting. So when they got back home, to think that the first order of business was to start writing songs, getting the band together, rehearsing, is, in my opinion, not realistic. This is not how people function. This is how people might function in a fictional story, but not in reality. Later in the presentation coming up, I'm going to take you through Scott Fryman and Mark Lewison's narrative, and both those guys who were considered experts in the narrative, the official narrative, tell us that the Beatles came into the studio for Rubber Soul with essentially no backlog of music. So the last question is, when did the Beatles write music? And as we just heard from the BBC interview, Paul told us that they wrote in great big batches leading into or during the recording of an album or film. And really, it's leading into an album because their films, A Hard Day's Night and Help, were embedded within the recording time frame of the albums. So they were really writing the songs, and again, that's if they were writing the songs for the albums, because the album tracks were then ported over to the film soundtracks. Okay, so with that, let's move to chart number three. Okay, so let's take a little trip back in time, going back to my big presentation. Did the Beatles write all their own music? That was released in April of 2020. And back then, I did a high-level assessment for 1963, 1964, and 65 to try to understand at a high level where the Beatles spent their time in those given years. So on the left, I have 1963, to the right, 1964, and on the next chart, I will show you 1965. And it's important to note that when I did these slides, I did not have knowledge of the August 5th, 1966 BBC interview. Because if I had, 
I probably would not have done these slides because I was trying to figure out when did the Beatles really have time to write their music because I was suspicious of the official narrative's explanation that they were writing all the time. So it didn't matter whether they were touring, it didn't matter whether they were in the recording studio, uh, whether they were on the film set of A Hard Day's Night or Help or when they were on holiday or had downtime. In other words, it didn't matter where they were, what they were doing, they always found time to write songs. So I started to question this narrative. And as I mentioned, I wanted to understand, okay, so at a very high level, and this is high level, it's not an exact science, but I just wanted to begin to get the lay of the land. What exactly were they doing in those years? Where were they? What were the activities? So if we start here, it's going to be very difficult to see, but there's a small sliver and it represents one day and it's the album Please Please Me. This is their debut UK album. The official narrative tells us that in one long session on February 11th of 1963, the Beatles recorded 10 of the 14 tracks on that day. It's a very, very strange story. It's not believable, in my opinion, but we'll just leave that where it is. That'll be a story for another day. If we move to the next slice in the pie chart, we have with the Beatles. The number of days between when recording officially began for the album and when it concluded is 41 days or 11% of the year. Now, there's something I want to clarify to make sure it's understood. When I talk about the number of days in the studio for a particular album, it's important to understand that the number of days reflects the number of days between when the recording sessions began and concluded. It is not the number of days the record button was pushed. Other studio activities, such as writing songs, potentially, working on arrangements, rehearsing, overdubs, which are outside of the basic rhythm tracks, editing, and mixing would be contained within the recording timeline. And 41 days is essentially a month and a half. And a month and a half to crank out an album is very quick turnaround. Okay, so it's very important to understand this, that there are other activities that take place. So with the Beatles, 41 days or 11% of the year. And then their touring and their live gigs was a huge, huge piece of 1963. And you can see that in the brown wedge here, and that represented 247 days or 68% of the year. So then when we move to the green slice, this is again at a high level. I'm trying to get a high level assessment. The number of days potentially where they can write music without being obligated to the recording studio or touring. And when we get to 1964 and 65 to filming. So again, what I was doing with this analysis, I was obviously trying to figure out where they were spending their time, but I was also trying to figure out whether it was worth pursuing the concept that they did not write all their own music. Because if the data did not shake out the way it did, where the green wedges are relatively small, when we compare it to the time connected to tours, the studio, and filming, then in all likelihood, it's possible that I would not have pursued the analysis into whether they wrote their music or not. It was because of this initial data analysis that I decided to take a deeper dive. And when I did that, I was finding more and more information, more evidence that supported the concept or the theory that they did not write all their own music or play on all of their recorded tracks. And with that, let's take a look at chart number four and take a look at 1965 when the Beatles released Help and Rubber Soul and restate 1965 in terms of Paul's comment that the Beatles wrote in great big batches as they were going into the studio to record an album. Okay, so here's 1965. It's the same exact format as the pie charts that I showed on the previous slide. And to the right is the restatement based upon Paul saying that 
they wrote in great big batches. But before we get there, let me read you some quotes from an interview that John Lennon did when he was talking about the Beatles on the set of the Help movie. During the filming of Help, John Lennon said, Help was where we turned on to pot. We were smoking marijuana for breakfast during that period. Nobody could communicate with us. It was all glazed eyes and giggling all the time, in our own world. It's like doing nothing most of the time, but still having to rise at 7 a.m., so we became bored. Dick Lester, who was the director for the film, knew that very little would get done after lunch. In the afternoon, we very seldom got past the first line of the script. We had such hysterics that no one could do anything. So on the film set of Help, the Beatles spent their time stoned. And Dick Lester couldn't do anything after midday with them. So we have to ask ourselves, if they couldn't get through their lines for the movie, do we actually believe that they were sitting down and writing songs? If you ask me, no. But I'll let you decide. So let's go to 1965. And as I mentioned, it's the same format as the previous pie charts that I just showed you. But what we see in 1965 that we didn't see in 1963 and 1964 is the amount of time not associated with being in the studio, being on tour, and doing films grows to six months or half the year. So for 1965, it appears feasible that the Beatles had time, which was not connected to being in the studio or being on tour or being on film sets where they could write music. And then we have the August 5th, 1966 BBC interview and Paul blows it all up. Because when we take 1965 and we restate it per Paul's explanation as to when and how the music was written, two thirds of the year evaporates. Because by writing in great big batches as they were going to record an album means their songwriting took place in the green wedge and the orange wedge on the right-hand side of this slide, the restated pie chart. It's ironic in a way that for 1965, the official narrative actually works better in explaining when the Beatles had time to write music because half the year was not tied to activities like the studio, touring, and films. But Paul blows it up. And he says, nope, we wrote right here. And to put it into context, the Help and Rubber Soul recording sessions turned out 32 songs, of which 30 were originals. Of the 30 originals, 26 were original Lennon and McCartney album tracks, and four were Lennon and McCartney singles. And they did this all within four months. So 30 original compositions cranked out, and we're talking about top shelf songs too. There's not a whole lot of filler track between Help and Rubber Soul. They cranked out 30 originals in four months. And as we know, of the four months, Rubber Soul was 30 days. So the other three months were dedicated to the Help recording sessions as well as filming the movie. And with Paul's big batches explanation, he puts the official narrative between a rock and a hard place. Because what are they going to do? Are they going to come back and say, oh, Paul McCartney doesn't know what he's talking about when they have elevated Paul McCartney to the status of a genius and prolific songwriter? So what the official narrative would rather do is just make believe that the August 5th, 1966 interview never happened and continue to tell the story that the Beatles were writing all the time, whenever they could, 365 days a year. So let's move to slide number five and take a look at some George Martin quotes. Okay, so before I get to the George Martin quotes and his assessment of the Beatles when he met them in 1962, there is a point that I want to clarify from the previous slide. Up to this point, I'm talking in terms of the possibility of the Beatles writing their own music. And so when I say that the Beatles wrote the music for help, and Rubber Soul within that four month window, one month for Rubber Soul and three months for Help. And we have to remember that the filming of Help 
was sandwiched in between the recording of the album. I'm talking in terms of most of their songs, the majority of their songs, 80 to 90 percent of their songs. And the reason why I'm clarifying this is because I know there are people who are watching this right now who are having difficulty getting their heads wrapped around this. Some folks might be short circuiting. They're going to go back to that BBC interview and they're going to say, hey, Mike, Paul said that they didn't write between albums normally, maybe one or two. There's a natural tendency for people to want to grab onto something, no matter how small it is or how nuanced it is, to try to retain what it is that they believe. If you take a step back and you listen to what Paul said, what he was saying is the vast majority of the music, if not all of it, was written in big batches when they were going into the studio to record an album. But as I said before, it really doesn't matter whether it's 10 songs, 12 songs, 14 songs, or 16 songs. Pick a number. It's still a monumental task to get that many songs written from scratch, rehearsed, arranged, and recorded within the time frames that were being told, especially in the case of Rubber Soul. Okay, so let's get to the George Martin quotes. Again, these are documented. I've played the audio and or the video in various presentations over the years. And then what I'll do is play this YouTube short, which I put together a couple of months ago, and it captures much of the quotes that you see on the chart. Okay, so back in the early part of 1962, Brian Epstein played the tapes for George Martin, and George Martin said to Brian Epstein after taking a listen, if you want me to judge them, meaning the Beatles, based on what you are playing me, I'm sorry, I need to turn you down. And then upon meeting the Beatles in 1962, George is quoted as saying, I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. And then in the documentary produced by George Martin, George is having a discussion with composer and broadcaster Howard Goodall. And George says to Howard, they had this wonderful charisma. They made you feel good. I thought their music was rubbish. And then the next quote, even though they had really nothing behind them, they were still fairly irreverent. Now, this is interesting because if we go back to the Complete Beatles, the documentary from 1982, as I mentioned much earlier in this presentation, we're told that John Lennon and Paul McCartney, either individually or working as a team, wrote 100 songs between them between 1956 and 1962. And yet, George Martin says they didn't have anything behind them. Then he says, so I looked at these four guys and thought, none of them shines above all the others. And then in another interview, George says, Love Me Do was the best song I could find from them at the time. I was very conscious it wasn't the big hit I was looking for. So here again, going back to the 100 songs between 1956 and 1962, the best song they had was Love Me Do, and that's even if the Beatles wrote Love Me Do. And in the documentary produced by George Martin, George, in his conversation with Howard Goodall, explains that he was looking for songs for the Beatles to record. This syncs up with the Mercy Beat article going back to August and September of 1962 that announced the departure of Pete Best and Ringo replacing Pete. But the article also goes on to say that the Beatles were flying to London to record songs written for them, not by them, for them, given to them by their recording manager slash producer, George Martin. So the official narrative is out of sync. One narrative is saying they wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. And then we have George Martin, who's their producer, saying they didn't have anything behind them. The best song they could muster up is Love Me Do. And George was very conscious that it was not the big hit that he was looking for. And then the last quote is very telling. In an interview, he says, they certainly had no, and if you watched a clip, 
it appears that George is selecting his words very carefully. He almost said they certainly had no songwriting skills, but he shifts it up and says it wasn't too obvious they can be songwriters at this stage, that their songs were pretty awful. And he again says that Love Me Do was the best thing that they had. So not the most flattering assessment that you would read about the Beatles. So let's take a listen now to this short. And like I said, I put it up about two months ago or so, maybe three months ago, and I incorporated a lot of these quotes. So let's take a listen. We're limited as a group. It wasn't too obvious that they could be songwriters at the stage, but there's some of them really awful. What I said to Brown was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. Well, I was looking for something original because I didn't want to do one of the oldies that they've been doing as part of their act. And Love Me Do was the best song that they, I could find from them at that time. I was very conscious that it wasn't the, the big hit I was looking for. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I couldn't make up the sound, you know, it was something I hadn't heard before. I thought their music was rubbish. The guitar solo in the show is my accomplish. Yeah, we're the first to say that we're not all that good anyway musically. So toward the end, George Martin says that the guitar solo in Michelle is his composition. I think it's very possible that the entire song was composed by George Martin. Of course, we have Billy or Paul McCartney's version of that story, which says he used to play his guitar in a cafe and he was playing whatever he had at the time of Michelle in order to flirt with the ladies. But that's just a story, in my opinion. Okay, so with that, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about Donovan. Okay, so for the Donovan segment, I decided that I was not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to replay a video that was uploaded to my channel back in March of 2022. The title of the video is Donovan Doubles and the Legacy of Billy Shears. The basis of the video comes from a post that was on Steve Fauber's Paul is Dead page two years ago, where one of the members of the page was able to speak to Donovan. He had VIP tickets and a meet and greet at a Donovan concert, and he was able to ask Donovan some questions, and Donovan responded. I'm not going to spoil it for you. You can take a listen, and you can decide for yourself. Now, Donovan was close to the Beatles. He knew Biological Paul, and, of course, he knows Billy. In memoirs, it hints that he is either the author or the co-writer of the song Yellow Submarine. Many Beatle fans probably know the story where Donovan, when he was with the Beatles in India, taught John Lennon the guitar picking that we hear on the song Dear Prudence. Now, I think it's possible that it's not John on the recorded track. I think it is, in fact, Donovan laying down the guitar track for Dear Prudence, Julia, and possibly Happiness is a Warm God. So let's take a listen to this clip from two years ago. Okay, so the next slide is a comment that was posted on Steve Farber's Paul is Dead page. And it had to do with Donovan. And of course, in memoirs, Billy tells us that Donovan was completely on board with the replacement and that Donovan was a contributing songwriter. And one of those songs that we believe that Donovan was heavily involved in was the writing of Yellow Submarine. Now, the way this came to me is a friend who was on Steve's page, a member, picked up on this comment and they emailed me and said, hey, Mike, this comment was posted on Steve's page and I thought you would be interested. And I asked my friend if they would reach out to the person who posted the comment and if they would be willing to come on the show to talk about the conversation that they had with Donovan. And unfortunately, the person declined. They, they didn't want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is fine. A lot of people just don't want to go like public, public with this stuff. And I understand that. So what I'm going to do is read the post. I want to thank this person for putting this comment up because it's very, very important and it's very enlightening. 
Okay, so I'm going to read it. I have to put my readers on, otherwise I won't be able to read it. So here it goes. A few years ago, I attended a Donovan concert in San Francisco, and I paid for one of those meet and greet tickets. I actually got up the nerve and asked Donovan how the Beatles could write so much great material so quickly over the years, and especially during the Beatlemania years. He told me that, quote, there's more to the story than likely anyone will ever know. He said that he had, quote, brought them a few silly songs, but that there were others in the fold. I was shocked that he even answered me at all. I was expecting nothing and got gold. It was almost like he was unloading some information that he had been holding inside. That was the sense I got. The last thing he said to me as he walked away, quote, there was a genius songwriter, and he didn't give me his name, that would take care of things like this while the boys were out gallivanting. I'll never forget those words. The meeting was only a couple of minutes, and I'll never forget it. I couldn't believe he even answered me at all. I remember him being in a lot of pain, and he had a cane, and was being assisted by a younger man. I guess I was feeling a bit bold at this point, because I asked him if he could tell me the genius man's name. He just gave me a half smile and shook his head and said, quote, I think I've said enough. I'll never forget this encounter. And by the way, he put on a really good show. He signed an album for me. Very nice man. So there you go, folks. The disclosure comes in bits and pieces. There's not going to be a single source for any of this stuff. But what this goes to show is there are people out there that have pieces to the puzzle. Okay, so with this segment, I'm going to take you through some credible mainstream Beatles sources that confirm the mainstream narrative that the Beatles came into the Rubber Soul sessions with essentially no backlog of music. And the reason why I'm doing this is because many Beatles fans are so conditioned by the official narrative and their belief system is so invested in the Beatles story that they avoid basic fundamental research in order to avoid any conflict with what it is that they believe about the Beatles. As an example, I received a comment and this person wrote, the Beatles never claimed to have written Rubber Soul in 30 days. The only person who ever made that claim is a guy named Scott Fryman who never worked for or was associated with the Beatles and is the author of the video Deconstructing Rubber Soul. And so in a moment, I'm going to take you through Scott's credentials. And I'm also going to take you through what Mark Lewison has in his 1988 book on the Beatles recordings. But before we get to Scott's resume and what Mark has in his book, let's start very basic because this is where most people would go first. They would go to Wikipedia. So if we go to the circled area here on the chart, we can see that the release date for Rubber Soul is December 3rd, 1965. The date range for the recording of the album, October 12th through November 11th. I start the clock at October 11th because that's when the Beatles arrived in the studio. October 12th is the first day that they began recording. So that's the 30 days, October 11th through November 11th, with October 12th being the first day in which recording commenced. And then you're going to see a date of June 17th, 1965 for Wait. And that's because the song Wait, which is on Rubber Soul, we are told by the official narrative, was recorded back during the help recording sessions earlier in the year. And the official narrative tells us the Beatles needed one more song to be able to put 14 on the album, seven songs on each side. So what they did was they took weight off the shelf, they did some more overdubs, and that gave them their 14th song. And we'll talk a little bit more about the song Wait because it's an interesting little discussion. So in my April 2020 presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? I compared the Wikipedia entry to Scott Fryman's narrative, and it syncs up nicely. It's the same story. Except Wikipedia was not very specific about when the Beatles 
wrote the songs for Rubber Soul. So here's what Wikipedia says about the songs. Most of the songs on Rubber Soul were composed soon after the Beatles returned to London following their August 1965 North American tour. So it's this very topical, vague, nonspecific wording. And I think it was done intentionally. And the reason why I think that is because when you put too many specifics around a story, it invites the possibility of too much scrutiny. And so when Wikipedia says the songs were composed soon after the Beatles returned to London, the question becomes, can you please be more specific about what the word soon means? Was it as soon as they walked off the airplane? Was it a week later? Two weeks later? Was it October 11th of 1965? There's no specifics. This is a tactic that's used many times in mainstream narratives, where they will put information out there with little to no specifics because they know that the reader will fill in the blanks. And in the case of Beatle fans, when they're confronted with the question, how did the Beatles write and record 16 songs in 30 days? They will fall back on wording like this and then tell you that it is evidence or proof that the Beatles were writing the songs before they got to the studio, even though the wording does not say that. It does not say that they were writing music in that period of time from when the tour concluded to when they entered the studio on October 11th of 1965. But what the person is actually doing is filling in the blanks in order to accommodate their belief system around the Beatles. The narrative that I presented gets very uncomfortable for them. So they go out and they search for information which they think supports what they want to believe. When in fact, wording like we have here in Wikipedia is not evidence or proof of the Beatles writing before they got into the studio on October 11th of 1965. And again, the premise here is that the Beatles are actually writing their music. I'm still on that thread. The wording in Wikipedia, as nonspecific as it is, still confirms that the Beatles essentially had no backlog of music coming into the Rubber Soul recording sessions. Whether they began writing on September 1st or October 11th becomes a non-discussion, because if we go back to the BBC interview, John and Paul said, that it took weeks just to write one song. So let's just say they were writing during that holiday period. And again, that narrative is not supported by the official story. So even if they got off the airplane and they got right down to business and they were feverishly writing, how many songs could they have completed? Maybe one, maybe two. It goes back to what I said before. 10 songs, 12 songs, 14 songs, or 16 songs in 30 days is a monumental task. But when we get to the Scott Fryman and Mark Lewison charts, you're going to see that it gets a lot more specific. Let's move now and talk about the Beatles Bible and their information. Okay, so the Beatles Bible, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because most of you I'm going to assume are very familiar with the site. It is a very good source of official narrative information. And you can see I circled the dates as to when Rubber Soul was recorded. It's the same dates that we see in Wikipedia. So recording begins on October 12th. It ends on November 11th. And we have the June 17th date for the song Wait, which we will talk about in a moment. So going back a few months ago, I was made aware that the Beatles Bible on their YouTube channel published a video titled The Making of Rubber Soul Was a Shit Show. And some people thought that maybe it was a response video to my work, whether it was or was not, I don't know. But what I will say is that the official narrative that is spelled out in the Beatles Bible video on Rubber Soul is the same official narrative that I give you when I talk about my work and Rubber Soul. The big difference, of course, is the Beatles Bible is going to promote the official narrative around Rubber Soul, which essentially says that the Beatles pulled a rabbit out of the hat during that 30-day period of time. And my research, which starts with the official narrative, which is the same official narrative that 
the Beatles Bible is telling us in this video, I do a deep dive. And I concluded that no, there was no rabbit that was pulled out of the hat. It's actually a lot more straightforward. The songs were already written and recorded prior to the Beatles stepping into the studio. And the Beatles' responsibility over that 30-day period of time from October 11th to November 11th of 1965 was to learn and sing the vocal tracks. Okay, so with that, like I said, I'll drop the link to the video down below in the description box. And let's talk a little bit about the song Wait. I found this to be a little humorous. So in the Beatles Bible, it tells us, first recorded and left off the Help album, Wait was exhumed during the final day's recording for Rubber Soul, nearly five months later. So the final day of recording for Rubber Soul was November 11th, and that recording session was a marathon, and it went into the early morning hours of November 12th. So the official narrative tells us that the basic rhythm tracks for Wait were recorded back during the Help recording sessions. And when the Beatles needed another song to fill out the album, 14 songs, seven songs on side A, seven songs on side B, George Martin pulled Wait off the shelf. And they added some overdubs. The Beatles Bible goes on to tell us that Wait was written while the Beatles were filming Help in the Bahamas and was originally intended for inclusion in the soundtrack. Now, the reason why I found this humorous is because I read you some quotes earlier in the presentation where John Lennon was describing their altered state of consciousness while they were filming Help. He said that they were in a haze of marijuana. And John went on to say that the director of the film, Richard Lester, couldn't get anything done beyond midday with them because they couldn't recite their lines because they were stoned. Yet, here's the official narrative telling us that while they're on the set of Help, filming in the Bahamas, they're writing songs. In this case, wait. So we have to ask the question, if the director is throwing up his hands because he can't get these guys to get through their lines, we're supposed to believe that they're sitting down and writing songs. Okay, so with that, let's move to slide number nine. Let's look at Scott Fryman's resume and his credentials as it pertains to the Beatles official narrative and his expertise on the topic. Okay, so as many of you know who follow my work, it was Scott Fryman's presentation on the making of Rubber Soul, which is part of his Deconstructing the Beatles series, that got me very interested in taking a look into whether the Beatles wrote all of their own music. And every once in a while, there's a comment that comes across, and I mentioned one earlier, and I'll read it again, where the person says that the Beatles never claimed to have written Rubber Soul in 30 days. The only person who has ever made this claim is a guy named Scott Fryman. And obviously, this person did not take the time to do a simple search to take a look at Scott's credentials and his resume as it pertains to the Beatles' official narrative. So what I'm going to do is take you through some bullets here from Scott's website to show that Scott is an expert in the Beatles' official narrative. So if you're going to deconstruct the official narrative, in this case around Rubber Soul, there's no better place to start than from the work of a person who is an expert in the official narrative, right? Makes sense. So in any case, Scott is a composer and musician. He's the creator of the Deconstructing the Beatles series. He is an internationally recognized expert and lecturer on the music of the Beatles. He has presented his lectures to sold out audiences at theaters nationwide and has spoken about the Beatles at colleges, universities, and corporations. In the fall of 2012 at Yale University, Mr. Fryman taught a semester course titled The Beatles in the Studio. He co-hosts the monthly Fab Four Masterclass with fellow Beatleologist Kenneth Womack. He is the co-founder and CEO of QWire Incorporated. He has a bachelor's in computer science and music from Yale University and a master's of music composition from New York University. So, 
when this person writes this comment and is basically saying, well, who the heck is Scott Fryman? This is who Scott is. Scott is considered an expert in the Beatles' official narrative. So let's move to the next slide and take a look at what Scott told us about Rubber Soul from an official narrative perspective. Okay, so this is what Scott told us in Deconstructing Rubber Soul. In the fall of 1965, the Beatles were exhausted. They had just come off a tour and they were tired. The tour was cut short to make an album for the Christmas season. The pattern was two albums a year with the second album in time for Christmas. Plus, they had to do a single and a flexi disc for their fan club. This time, the Beatles had not been writing material and they were really empty. The Beatles entered the studio on October 11th. To have Rubber Soul in stores by Christmas, they had to wrap up by November 11th, which means they had 30 days to write, learn, rehearse, arrange, and record the album. Both sides of the single, as well as the album, hit number one on the charts. So that's the highlights of the official narrative around Rubber Soul coming from Scott Fryman, who is an expert in the Beatles' official narrative. Now let's move to the next slide and take a look at what Mark Lewison tells us about Rubber Soul. And what we're going to see is his telling of the narrative and Scott's telling of the narrative are in sync. Okay, so the information on this slide comes from Mark Lewison's book, The Beatles Recording Sessions from 1988, the official Abbey Road Studio Session Notes, 1962 through 1970. And it is one of the two Mark Lewison books that I own. So here's how Wikipedia introduces Mark. Since the 1980s, he has written many reference books about the Beatles and has worked for EMI, MPL Communications, and Apple. He has been referred to as the world's leading authority on the band. So Mark is a subject matter expert when it comes to the official narrative. Now on page 63 of the book, The Beatles Recording Sessions, we have an entry for Tuesday, October 12th. And I did have to trim up the wording a little bit in order to get everything to fit on the slide for the Doubting Thomases. You can get a copy of the book and go to these pages and see that what I have is what is in the book. So for Tuesday, October 12th, the Beatles had released two albums of new material in 1963 and 1964. And now in 1965, they had to do the same again. The problem was they had very little material to work with and time was getting on. John and Paul, really for the first time in their lives, had to force themselves to come up with more than a dozen new songs, which they later admitted was very impossible. Now, please note, Mark is saying they had to come up with more than a dozen songs. That means more than 12. Then, with George and Ringo, they had to zip through a crash series of recording sessions in order to have the LP in stores by early December. The recording sessions began on October 12th. Then if we go to page 68, we have this for Thursday, November 11th. The deadline had come. The album had to be finished immediately, hence the marathon recording session. 13 hours without any proper break and ending at 7 a.m. Three more songs were needed. Balance was everything in 1965. A 13-song album was just not done. 14 meant seven songs per side, and everything honky-dory. And then on page 68, for Monday, November 15th, we're told that the final mix was completed. Then on the 16th of November, George Martin worked out the LP running order and telephoned it over to Abbey Road. On the 17th of November, disc cutter Harry Moss made the mono LP. And again, on the 19th, because of problems with the first disc. On the 23rd, the stereo version was cut. Lacquer discs were rushed to the plant, the sleeves were quickly printed, and finished copies of the new Beatles LP were in the shop by December 3rd. So we can see that Mark's narrative syncs up very nicely with Scott's narrative. It's also the same narrative that I present in my presentations when I'm talking about the official story. The Beatles arrive in the studio on October 11th, Recording begins on October 12th. The last day of recording is November 11th, going into the very early hours of November 12th. On the 15th, the final mix is done. On the 16th of November, George Martin works out the running order or the sequencing. On the 17th, 
the mono lacquer is cut, and the initial batches of rubber sole are in stores by December 3rd. So with that, let me take you through some of my notes as it pertains to what Mark has in his book. Okay, so Mark kicks off the entry on page 63 for Tuesday, October 12th by saying the problem was they had very little material to work with. And of course, that's the same narrative that Scott Fryman gives us. And then Mark goes on to tell us that for the first time in their lives, they had to force themselves to come up with more than a dozen new songs, which they later admitted was very impossible. So the wording that they had to force themselves to come up with more than a dozen new songs, which they later admitted was very impossible, appears to be sourced from the August 5th, 1966 BBC interview. But what that interview does not say is that Rubber Soul was the first time that the Beatles wrote in great big batches. Paul said they did not write between LPs normally, maybe one or two. And by saying that they did not write between LPs, plural, normally, meant that that was the process. Rubber Soul was not an exception. Paul was telling us any time an LP came up, they wrote in great big batches. So the wording that Rubber Soul was the first time in their lives that they had to force themselves to come up with more than a dozen new songs does not reconcile with what Paul told us in that August 5th, 1966 interview. Also, if the wording that Mark has here is indeed sourced from the August 5th interview, then it appears that Mark is putting that interview around the context of Rubber Soul. Whereas when I listened to that interview, I thought John and Paul were talking about Revolver. And the reason is because the interview was given on August 5th of 1966 when Revolver was released, but recording for Revolver concluded on June 21st of 1966, or six weeks prior to the interview. So when John and Paul said, with the last LP, it took us weeks to write one song, the last LP, in my mind, would have been Revolver, not Rubber Soul. However, if the interview was in the context of Rubber Soul and not Revolver, then the Rubber Soul narrative becomes more problematic because John and Paul said it took us weeks just to get one song written. Well, Rubber Soul spanned 30 days or four weeks. If it took them weeks, plural, to complete one song, then how were they able to get through all the other songs for the Rubber Soul sessions? Another reason why I believe John and Paul were talking within the context of Revolver and not Rubber Soul in the August 5th interview is because when I take you to slide 14, I'm going to show you how quickly the official narrative tells us that they banged out the songs for Rubber Soul. So I believe the interview was discussing Revolver. And then Mark's narrative goes on to say that the Beatles had to zip through a crash series of recording sessions. What about the time to learn the songs, rehearse the songs, and arrange them before recording? This is another example where the narrative goes from writing to recording and skips all of the steps in between. Then we're told the deadline had come. The album had to be finished immediately, and that would be on November 11th of 1965. And then we're told that on that last day of recording, November 11th, the Beatles needed three more songs. And those three songs would be Wait, which was pulled in from the help sessions, Girl, and You Won't See Me. Both those songs, Girl and You Won't See Me, were allegedly written on the last day of recording, on November 11th. So Wait is pulled in, and then two songs were written rehearsed, and recorded on the last day of recording. It appears to be an impossible task to me, but I'll let you decide. Now, on the last day, they also worked on another song. They finished up I'm Looking Through You, because recording for that song began on November 6th, and they finished it up on the 11th during that 13-hour period of time. And then we're told balance was everything in 1965, 
a 13-song album was just not done. 14 meant seven songs per side. Now, what's interesting is all of the Beatles' albums between Please Please Me and Revolver, their first seven albums, contained 14 tracks. The only album that did not was A Hard Day's Night. That was 13 tracks. So 14 songs per Beatle album was not unique. Six of their first seven LPs contained 14 songs. And the number 14 contains two sevens. So seven songs on side A, seven songs on side B, and 77 is an occult number. The number seven represents spiritual or higher states of consciousness. So during the Beatles' early period, they released seven albums, Please Please Me, through Revolver. Those seven albums contained 77 original Beatle compositions. The name of the band, the Beatles, in Pythagorean numerology, reduces to the number seven, and the Beatles' tenure as a band, their timeline when they were together, 1962 through 1969, represents seven years. So the number seven is all around them. And then, last but not least, on the 16th of November, George Martin worked out the LP running order. On the 17th, the mono lacquer was cut, the lacquer discs were rushed to the plant, the sleeves were quickly printed, and finished copies of the new Beatles LP were in the shop by December 3rd. Now, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on the manufacturing process. And I'm going to explain how it just wasn't a one, two, three, snap your fingers and the center labels and the album jackets just magically appear one day after completing the sequencing of the songs. In fact, this piece of the process presents big problems for the Rubber Soul narrative, and I'll get into it in just a bit. But before I do that, let's go to the next slide and take a look at the Beatles U.S. tour which concluded on August 31st, and then they had that six-week period of time between the tour and when they arrived at EMI on October 11th of 1965. And let's take a look at what Mark Lewison tells us about whether the Beatles were writing any music during that six-week period of time before coming into the studio. Okay, so the title of the chart is giving the answer away. The Beatles enjoyed a six-week break without work. And that comes to us from Mark Lewison's book, The Complete Beatles Chronicles, from 1992, page 202. Mark explains that after the tour, the Beatles enjoyed a six-week break without work. I know there are people who are listening, who are still resisting, and they're going to say, songwriting is not work. Yes, it is. Writing songs, Teaching the songs to the other band members who didn't write the song. Rehearsing is work. Ask any musician or songwriter and they will tell you it's work. And if we go back to the previous slide, slide 11, Mark Lewison tells us the problem was they had very little material to work with coming into the Rubber Soul sessions. And of course we have Paul McCartney, in the August 5th, 1966 BBC interview, stating that they did not write songs between albums normally, maybe one or two. I know a lot of people would like to nuance what Paul said, because there's that part of their brain which is saying there's something suspect or sketchy about the Rubber Soul narrative, but they don't want to deal with it. They still want to embrace the official story. But if we go with the premise that John and Paul, and occasionally George, were writing their own music, then I think we should be taking the man at his word. The problem that the official narrative has, as I explained earlier in this presentation, is what are they going to do? Are they going to say that Paul McCartney's wrong? That he's misremembering his process of how he went about songwriting? So because Paul said that they wrote in great big batches whenever they had to do a record, or a film takes the process all the way back to their first album, Please Please Me, and all the way through to Revolver. And to add another layer to this, because the Beatles' narrative is layered, I believe what Paul was really saying is we had to 
learn the songs in great big batches. And what I mean by that is when the Beatles came into the studio, the songs were already pre-written and pre-recorded. They had to learn the vocals so that they can lay down the vocal tracks. And once they got that done, George Martin was then able to mix the pre-existing backing tracks or instrumentals with their final vocal tracks. And so with that, let's move to slide number 13, and I will discuss the two fundamental issues that I discovered which led me to conclude that the Beatles did not write all their own music and they did not play on all of their recorded tracks. Alrighty, so here are the two fundamental problems with Rubber Soul at a glance. One, the ability to write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 new songs in 30 days is highly unlikely. Two, aside from recording the music, the cycle time to manufacture the record, which includes the creation of the record labels, album art, sleeve design, printing, packaging, and distribution, was not possible based on when recording concluded and the final lacquer was cut. In other words, there was not enough time. And so with that, let's move to slide 14, and let's take a look at problem number one, the ability to write and record 16 new songs in 30 days. Okay, so if you follow my work, this is a version of a slide that you have seen before. It was in my big presentation going back to April of 2020, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? And also the addendum going back to last April of 2023. So I'm going to take you through the 16 songs in 30 days. Now, before we get started, some people want to argue and banter back and forth about whether it was 16 songs or something less. Mark Lewison tells us it was more than a dozen songs. When I was doing the research and putting my big presentation together, I identified two songs that were in partial or draft mode. Those songs were Michelle and We Can Work It Out. The song Wait was not introduced into the Rubber Soul sessions until the tail end of the sessions. It wasn't until they needed one more song to complete the album with 14 tracks. And that's when they brought Wade in. So the song Wait was not in the mix when the Beatles stepped into the studio on October 11th of 1965. In the minds of the Beatles, they had to write 14 songs for the album and two more songs for a double A side single. So the song Wait wasn't even on the radar until the very end of the Rubber Soul sessions. Another song that we should talk about is What Goes On, because this is a song that many Beatle fans believe was a song that was complete, already written, and brought into the Rubber Soul sessions. However, when you look into the background of the song, what you'll find is that the version that we hear on Rubber Soul is substantially different than the version of the song that John Lennon allegedly wrote back in 1959. So if you have a song that is substantially different than its initial iteration, that means that the song was rewritten. And rewriting takes time. So after you're done rewriting and revamping the song, then you have to present it to your band members. They have to learn the song. And then they go off and rehearse the song. And once they rehearse, there's going to be changes. There's going to be suggestions and input about, hey, maybe we should do this or do that. And then once those changes are incorporated, you go back, you rehearse the song again until you get to the point where you feel comfortable that you're ready to record it. So What Goes On was not a completed song that the Beatles took into the Rubber Soul sessions. And I would place it in the same category as Michelle and We Can Work It Out, where they were partial songs that required work in order to finish them. So What Goes On was not in the bag when the Beatles came into the studio on October 11th of 1965. Okay, so with that, we have two versions of the official narrative. The prevailing narrative is that the Beatles were writing music all the time. They were a perpetual motion machine of songwriting. 
Again, they wrote when they were on tour, they wrote when they were on holiday, they wrote when they were on film sets, and they wrote in the studio. And then we have the August 5th, 1966 interview where Paul McCartney said, that's not true. We did not write between LPs normally, maybe one or two. So what I'm going to do now, as I take you through this chart, is to show you that both those narratives are highly suspect. So let's just start with this baseline. The Beatles, per an agreement between Brian Epstein and George Martin, were responsible for releasing two albums and four singles per year. The singles were released about every three months, while the albums were released every six months. A link to the source for this information is provided in the description box below. So the release of another album during the second half of 1965 was in accordance with the release schedule. So in 1963, the Beatles released Please Please Me and With the Beatles. In 1964, they released A Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale. In 1965, they released Help and Rubber Soul. In 66, they released Revolver. And then at the very end of the year in 1966, they released that very odd album, A Collection of Oldies, which in essence was a greatest hits album from 1963 through 1966. And I don't know many people that would consider a three-year-old song to be an oldie, but that's a discussion for another day. So let's take a moment and take a look at both narratives. And the first one I'm going to look at is Paul's statement from the 1966 BBC interview, where he stated that he and John wrote in great big batches whenever they needed to record an album or do a film. And then I'll discuss the narrative that most Beatles fans are more familiar with, which tells us that the Beatles were writing songs all the time. The perpetual motion machine of songwriting. But let's first focus on Paul's statement that they wrote in great big batches and logic through why that approach would be unacceptable. The primary reason is because that approach introduces a tremendous amount of risk into the recording sessions. And what is that risk? It's the risk that the album doesn't get done. The official narrative tells us that the Beatles are operating within a 30-day window. It's finite. And they're coming into the studio with essentially no material. So this is a very high-risk endeavor. There are no guarantees that this record's going to get done. And we would have to believe that EMI and George Martin are okay with this approach. Basically, flying by the seat of their pants and throwing the Hail Mary and hoping you get a touchdown. There is no way that EMI and George Martin are leaving this to chance. So the premise that they're writing, rehearsing, and recording the songs within a 30-day period of time, and they came into the studio with basically a blank sheet of paper, is nonsense. This is why I said earlier that when Paul McCartney said that they wrote in great big batches, what he was really telling us by using the Masonic technique of masterfully speaking is they had to learn the vocals in great big batches so that they can record them. And this will become clearer as I take you through the data. But before I do that, let's swing back to the other narrative regarding this songwriting. And that's the narrative that most Beatles fans are familiar with. The Beatles were writing all the time. So we know the Beatles were obligated to release two albums a year. And according to the They Wrote All the Time narrative, there were no major issues with writing songs to complete the five albums before Rubber Soul. And yes, the preceding albums, aside from A Hard Day's Night, contained cover songs. However, even with the covers, the Beatles were still able to write eight original songs for Please Please Me, eight for With the Beatles, 13 for Hard Day's Night, which were all originals, eight original compositions for Beatles for Sale, and 12 originals for Help. So even with the hectic schedule that they carried from 1962 through 64 and into 65, with their live gigs, including their BBC appearances, tours, films in 64 and 65, recording two albums a year in 63 and 64, and then the Help album 
in the early part of 1965, they still found time to write songs because we are told they were writing all the time. Yet they came into Rubber Soul, their sixth studio album, with basically no songs. So the key question is, what the heck happened with Rubber Soul? Why were John and Paul not ready with songs? Why did they walk into the sessions with essentially no backlog of music? Was there a massive breakdown in communication? It's not like they didn't know that they were on the hook for a second album in 1965 because they had to do it in 1963 and they had to do it in 1964 and they completed the first album for 1965, Help, earlier in the year. And what about Brian Epstein, who is portrayed as being very meticulous, dotting his I's and crossing his T's, did he not reach out to Paul and John and the rest of the band and ask them how they were coming along with the songwriting because we have a second album due toward the end of the year and we're going to need 12, 14, or 16 songs? Brian wasn't managing them or keeping tabs on how they're progressing? And what about George Martin? Are we to expect that George Martin wasn't speaking to Brian Epstein or even the Beatles themselves? Also asking the question, how are we coming along with the songs? Because I've got studio time booked later in the year, and we're going to need 16 songs, lads, 14 for the album, and two more for a single. So, for Rubber Soul, it appears that everyone nodded off and went to sleep after the recording of Help. What I'm going to show you is they did not come in empty. The songs were pre-written by outside songwriters and pre-recorded by session players. So when the Beatles came into the studio on October 11th, their job was to learn the vocals in great big batches. And that batch meant 14 songs for the album and two songs for the single. So with that, let me step you through the chart. I'll cover the chronology of when the songs were recorded, start to finish, the elapsed days, starting with when the Beatles entered the studio on October 11th, the number of takes for each song, as well as other activities that took place during the 30 days. And once I break it down, I'm hoping that it becomes obvious that both narratives are highly suspect and that something else was going on with the recording of Rubber Soul. Okay, so let's focus on the right-hand side of the chart, and I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as I can. What I did was to break down the Rubber Soul sessions by month. We have October and November. And we know that the Beatles came into EMI Studios on October 11th of 1965, and they came in with essentially no backlog of music. So they come in on October 11th, and the very next day on October 12th, they finish recording Run For Your Life. And they did that in five takes. So Run For Your Life had to be written, learned by the other Beatles so that they knew how to play the song, and then rehearsed to the point where they were ready to record. So all of that took place within 24 hours. And when you see an asterisk next to the song, that means that recording began and concluded on the very same day. So on October 13th, two days in, the Beatles nail Drive My Car in four takes. Now, the number of takes is going to be a very important variable with regard to the believability factor of the official narrative. And I'll get to that in a moment. On October 16th, five days in, the Beatles finished Day Tripper in three takes. On October 18th, seven days in, they finished If I Needed Someone, and they did that in one take. On October 21st, 10 days in, they finished recording Norwegian Wood, and they did that in five takes. Now, I'm not going to go through every song. You can pause the video and you can take a look at the data yourself. But the rate and pace in which these songs are being knocked out is completely unrealistic. If I had to use an analogy, it's like the Beatles are a printing press, just turning out these songs like a machine. And remember the process. You have to write the songs, then you have to teach the songs to the rest of the band, then they have to rehearse their parts to make sure they've got them down. And usually what happens when you go through that piece 
of the process is there are going to be changes because somebody's going to say, hey, why don't we try this or why don't we do that? So then you make alterations to the song and then you go back to rehearsing and you continue to rehearse until you have it down to the point where you feel comfortable that you can record it. The other problem with this rate and pace and the progression of the songwriting is that it says that everything that the Beatles started, they finished. Everything they touched turned to gold. There were no false starts. There were no false starts with the music or the lyrics. Everything just magically came together. And that, my friends, is not reality. The Beatles are not writing these songs and they are not laying down the instrumental tracks. The Beatles' job was to learn the vocals so they can record them and then George Martin could marry the vocals with the instrumental tracks and complete the songs. Now, if we take a look at November 11th, I talked about this earlier in the presentation. This is where the Beatles had that marathon session that Mark Lewison told us about, and they finished recording four songs on the very last day, two of which, we're told, didn't exist before November 11th. That would be You Won't See Me and Girl. The song Wait, as we discuss, was pulled in from the help sessions, allegedly. And the fourth song, I'm Looking Through You, the narrator tells us that recording began back on November 6th, and it was finished up on November 11th. So let's move over to the left-hand side of the slide now, and let me summarize what's going on here. I think it's important that we go back to what Paul said in the August 1966 BBC interview. He said, it's a bit of a drag for the first two songs. In other words, getting them written. The last LP, we took weeks just trying to get one written. So if it took them weeks to get one song written, how were they banging out all these songs within 30 days? Also in the August 1966 interview, Paul states, we're limited as a group. We're the first to say we're not all that good musically. Well, if a band is not all that good musically, how were they nailing the rehearsals and the recording sessions of 16 songs within this time frame? As I mentioned before, the number of takes is a telltale sign that this narrative is fiction. Not one song took more than five takes to record the basic tracks. If we fast forward to the White Album sessions and you take a look at how many takes it took to get those songs recorded, you're looking at dozens, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 takes for many of the songs on the White Album. So a logical question to ask is, if the Beatles had all of this recording prowess back in 1965 for Rubber Soul, what happened three years later during the White Album sessions? How did they go from recording songs in five takes or less for Rubber Soul to recording songs of the White Album that took dozens and dozens of takes? There were six days during the 30 days when no recording was scheduled. One of the six days was due to fan club obligations that they had to attend to. There were two days where mixing took place. There was one day when they stepped out because they received their MBEs. And there were two days tied up with a TV show. So we already started with a very compressed timeline of 30 days, and now it's down to 24 at best. So if we go to the yellow highlighted box, in October, eight songs were recorded in 18 days with a total of 28 takes for all songs. That's an average of three and a half takes per song. In November, the remaining eight songs were recorded in 13 days with a total of 14 takes, half the number of takes it took them to record eight songs back in October. And that represents an average of 1.8 takes per song. It's not believable. This is not reality. So from October 11th through November 11th, the Beatles were able to nail 16 songs in a total of 42 takes, which is an average of 2.6 takes per song. Eight songs were started and completed on the same day. That's the asterisk I noted earlier. Four songs were completed on the very last day, on November 11th, and I took you through that. Okay, so let's move to slide number 15 now, and let's talk about the manufacturing process to get a record out the door. 
Okay, so let me walk you through the manufacturing process. And this is an overview. I go into greater detail in my big presentations. Did the Beatles write all their own music and the addendum? And the links will be down below in the description box. So what I did was to break this chart down into three parts. Part one is November 11th through the 16th, where recording ends. George Martin does the final editing. The songs are mixed down. The run times are established and the sequencing is completed. And as I take you through this, you're going to see that the sequencing piece of this presents a very big problem for the Rubber Soul narrative. Now, the cycle time to manufacture an album going back into the 1960s was two months or more, so eight plus weeks. And the starting point for the eight weeks is when the final lacquer is cut. In the case of Rubber Soul, the first mono lacquer was cut on November 17th of 1965, and EMI needed to get Rubber Soul out into the retail outlets by December 3rd of 1965. So from November 17th, when the first mono lacquer was cut, to December 3rd is 17 calendar days. Yet the typical cycle time, as I just mentioned, is eight weeks or more. So we'll just use eight weeks for the sake of argument. That's 56 calendar days. So George Martin and EMI took 56 days down to 17. That's a cycle time reduction of 70%. So the question to ask is an obvious one. How were they able to do that? Now, what I did in my presentations to give George Martin and EMI the benefit of the doubt that they would pull out all the stops to get Rubber Soul out to retail by December 3rd when the mono lacquer was cut on November 17th was to say that maybe they can do this in six weeks. And six weeks represents 42 calendar days. So George Martin and EMI still took the cycle time down by 60%, 42 days down to 17. And the question still stands, how did they do that? Now, for those of you who haven't watched my big presentations and are asking, how do I know the cycle time? It's because when I was researching, did the Beatles write all their own music? leading into April of 2020 when I released it, I was working with a source who has been in the music industry for decades, and they are very familiar with the vinyl pressing process. So this person told me that starting from when the lacquer is cut, the final lacquer, it's a two month or better process. And so I asked, well, what if EMI did everything they could to expedite the process? what would be the minimum amount of time to get that record out of the plant and into the stores? And he said, six weeks. In fact, they told me that the drying time alone for the ink on the album art and the sleeves took a week. So if it takes a week for the album art to dry before it can be handled, and the cycle time was reduced from eight weeks or six weeks down to 17 days, and seven of those 17 days <laughs> required that the album art dry, you can see that there's a problem with the story. So let me take a moment and break the six weeks down for you. And again, I'm going with six weeks because I wanted to give George Martin and EMI the benefit of the doubt that because the release of Rubber Soul and time for the Christmas buying season for EMI, because there's lots of money involved, that they were going to do everything they possibly could to get at least the initial batch of pressings out into retail. So we know for a fact that they were able to get at least some volume of records out to the stores by December 3rd. And that's what I refer to as the initial batch of pressings. And so they were able to do that in two weeks. So we subtract the two weeks from the six weeks and we're left with four weeks. Now the four week period of time in that six week cycle time takes place before the records can be pressed. So what happens in that four weeks? Well, they have to design and create the labels and the album sleeves. Then the labels and the sleeves have to be proofed. And once they're approved, it goes to printing. And when I talk about the labels, I'm referring to the center labels of the 33 RPM record. And then the album covers and the labels are sent to the plant. So it all seems 
very straightforward. But here's the problem, and it's a very big problem for the Rubber Soul narrative. The printing of the center labels and the album jacket cannot begin to be printed until the sequencing of the songs is completed. And the reason for that is because the center labels of the vinyl record contain the names of the songs in sequence or in the order they will play on the record. And the back cover of Rubber Soul, like the back cover for just about any record, also contains the names of the songs in the order in which they will play on the record, side A and side B. George Martin did not complete the sequencing until November 16th. And then the very next day, on the 17th of November, we're told that the final lacquer was cut for the mono version of Rubber Soul. Well, if the sequencing of the songs was not finalized until November 16th, then how are the records going to be pressed on the 17th or the latest November 18th? Because we have to remember that the center labels, which contains the name of the songs in sequenced order, are adhered to the vinyl at the same time that the record is being pressed. So that means the center labels and the album jackets had to be in-house prior to when the records were going to be pressed. There was no way that if the sequencing was done on the 16th of November, that George Martin and EMI had the ability to turn around thousands of center labels and thousands of album jackets within a day in order to start pressing the record either on the 17th or the 18th of November. Because again, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl record at the time of pressing. And once the records are pressed, they are packaged with the sleeves immediately. So the center labels and the album jackets had to be in-house and ready to go before the pressing of Rubber Soul commenced, which was either sometime during the 17th of November or the latest the next day. November 18th. So this tells us that the process to print the labels and the album jackets had to have begun weeks before November 17th. And with the process beginning weeks before the 17th of November means that the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing of the songs was already known weeks before. Okay, so with slide number 16, let me just summarize what I took you through on the previous chart. So we know that on the 16th of November, George Martin worked out the LP running order, which is also referred to as the sequencing. Calculating the run times or the length of the songs is required to complete the sequencing. Run times are calculated once the final recording of the song is complete, which would include any editing. Sequencing determines the order the songs will be appearing on the record, side A and side B. George Martin completed the sequencing on November 16th, 17 days before Rubber Soul was to be in stores. Without the sequencing completed, the center labels and the album jacket cannot be printed because both the labels and the back of the LP cover contain the names of the songs in playing order. So the question is, how were the center labels and the album sleeves ready by November 17th when the sequencing was completed just one day prior? And the answer is, the names of the songs and run times, as well as the sequencing, were known and completed well in advance of November 16th, meaning the labels and album sleeves were already printed with the sequenced song titles on standby and ready for when the pressing and packaging process commenced. So how was it possible to get all of this stuff done up front? All of the songs were pre-written and recorded prior to the Beatles entering the studio. Since the songs were already written and recorded, the names of the songs, run times, and sequencing were also known. Therefore, the center label and album cover manufacturing process could begin in advance of the Beatles completing the vocal tracks between October 11th and November 11th. Okay, so at this point, I'm sure the question that many of you are asking is, when did the manufacturing process begin for the center labels and the album covers in order to have them in-house by November 17th when the mono lacquer was cut? 
and I will get to those dates in a moment. But before I do that, I think it's important to revisit the key dates along the Rubber Soul timeline. So we know that the Beatles arrive at EMI Studios on October 11th of 1965. And on November 11th, going into the very early morning hours of November 12th, recording concludes. Then on November 15th, George Martin does the final mix. And then the next day on November 16th, he does the sequencing. On November 17th, the mono lacquer is cut. And the cutting of the lacquer means that the pressing process can now begin. However, two days later, on the 19th of November, there was a quality issue with the November 17th lacquer, and so they had to recut it. As a side note, records were pressed, copies were made based upon the November 17th mono lacquer. Those copies of Rubber Soul are referred to as the loud cuts, and they are sought after by collectors. And the reason why they're collectible is because not many copies were pressed based upon the November 17th lacquer. So now with the lacquer recut, they can begin the process of creating the stampers, start pressing the records, and to get the initial batch of pressings into the retail outlets by December 3rd. So now let's back up the calendar and figure out when the manufacturing process began for the center labels and the album jackets. So what I'm going to do is to take a look at three cycle times, eight weeks, six weeks, and four weeks. And within each of these cycle times, two weeks is a constant. And the reason why two weeks is a constant is because we know that between November 19th, when they had to recut the mono lacquer, to December 3rd, when they had to have rubber sole in stores, they were able to get the initial pressings of the record out. And from November 19th to December 3rd is 14 days or two weeks. If we go back to November 17th, when the first lacquer was cut, that's 16 days. Now, November 17th is an important date because even though there was a quality issue and they had to recut the lacquer, that was the deadline. That was the day they were shooting for to get the lacquer cut so that they can begin pressing the record. So if we look at the eight week cycle time and we back out the two weeks for pressing, that says they had six weeks to get the center labels and the album covers manufactured and in-house by November 17th. The 17th was a hard stop. That was the day that they had to get the mono lacquer cut so that they can begin the pressing process in order to get the records in stores by December 3rd. And even though EMI recut the lacquer two days later, on November 19th, they still pressed records based upon the first lacquer of November 17th. And how do we know that? Because the loud cut version of the album exists. So if we go back to the eight week cycle time, knowing that two weeks is dedicated to getting the initial pressings of Rubber Soul out, that says six weeks was dedicated to creating and delivering the center labels and the album jackets, which means the process started on or around October 8th in order to ensure that the center labels and the album jackets were in-house by November 17th. Now, if we drop down to the six-week cycle time, which is the expedited process, and we apply the same criteria, that says that two weeks is dedicated to getting the initial pressings out to the stores by December 3rd. That leaves four weeks to manufacture the center labels and the album jackets and have them in-house no later than November 17th. And that means the process would have started on or around October 22nd. Then what I did was to create a super expedited cycle time of four weeks. And again, we have to take two weeks out for the pressing process. That leaves us with two weeks for the manufacturing of the center labels and the album jackets. And the four week cycle time says that they would have had to start the manufacturing process on or around November 5th. Now at that point in the studio, the Beatles still had 
six songs to record. So no matter which scenario we look at, whether it be eight weeks, six weeks, or four weeks, in each case, the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing had to have been known. Otherwise, the final center labels and the final album jackets could not have been delivered on or before November 17th. So what this means is if the names of the songs, the run times, and the sequencing were already known, because otherwise you couldn't create the labels and the jackets, that means that the songs were pre-written and pre-recorded. So while the Beatles were in the studio recording the vocal tracks, the process of creating the final center labels and album jacket was well underway. With an eight-week cycle time, it says that the process started on October 8th, three days before the Beatles entered the studio. A six-week cycle time says the process began on or around October 22nd. And the four-week process, as I just mentioned, would have started on or around November 5th. So there is no way the manufacturing process, whether it be eight weeks, six weeks, or the super, super expedited time frame of four weeks, began once the sequencing was decided and the lacquer was cut. Because if they did start the process, let's say on November 17th when the lacquer was cut, there is no way Rubber Soul would have been in stores on December 3rd. Now let's take a look at when Rubber Soul would have been in stores if the manufacturing process began right after the sequencing of the songs was finalized and the lacquer was cut. So at the top of the chart, you see a finger pointing to the numbers 7 and 8. Number 7 is the timeline at 6 weeks. So if the process began on November 17th when the mono lacquer was cut, then Rubber Soul would have been in stores on December 29th after Christmas. The 8-week cycle time would have put the release in stores on January 12th. The four-week scenario would have put Rubber Soul in stores on or around December 15th, which is two weeks beyond December 3rd. And obviously EMI decided that December 3rd was the date in order to capitalize on the Christmas buying season. We talked about how the lacquer was originally cut on the 17th and then it had to be recut on the 19th. And here's the reason why the lacquer had to be recut. Now, Harry Moss was the mastering engineer for EMI. Shortly after the production run, EMI decided that Moss had cut the album too loud and ceased production. After Moss recut the mono lacquers on November 19th, new metal parts were made and the pressing of the album resumed. Okay, so that's a little history behind the loud cut. If we go to the bottom left-hand side of the chart, let me take you through some time frames to get a feel for how short and how compressed the timeline was. So from the end of recording on November 11th to the release of Rubber Soul on December 3rd, 22 days. From the final mix on November 15th to December 3rd, only 18 days. From when the sequencing was finalized on November 16th, to December 3rd, 17 days. From when the original lacquer was cut on November 17th to December 3rd, 16 days. And from when the lacquer was recut on November 19th to December 3rd, only 14 days. So what this is showing is a significant level of time compression within the process, which takes us back to there had to be something going on prior to the Beatles coming into the studio. And that something else is the songs were already written and they were pre-recorded. And therefore, the names of the songs, the run times of the songs, and the sequencing was already known. And because of that, George Martin and EMI were able to begin the process well in advance of the Beatles finishing up recording. And the Beatles were not writing the songs. They were not recording the songs. What they were doing for that 30-day stint for Rubber Soul was learning the vocals in great big batches and then recording them. So George Martin could take the final vocals and mix it down with the 
instrumental tracks and bring the songs together. So with that, let's move to slide 19 and I will summarize the process. Okay, so how did Rubber Soul really work? And I concluded this was the template that was used throughout the Beatles timeline, but especially during the 1962 through 1966 period. So from Please Please Me through Revolver. So from January 1st through October 10th, the Beatles were finishing up their Christmas shows from the prior year. They recorded the Help album, they did the Help film, and they also had their European and US tours. So while the Beatles were doing all this, George Martin behind the scenes was getting the songs written, arranged, recorded, and mixed. Once he had the songs recorded and mixed, he had the run times and he could do the sequencing. And once the sequencing is known, then the album sleeves and labels can go into production so that the center labels and the sleeves are in-house by the time the Beatles finish up recording the vocals and when EMI is ready to start pressing the records. And remember, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl at the time of pressing, not afterward. Okay, so let me just go through each one of these numbered verticals here to step you through what took place. Step one, George Martin has all of the songs for Rubber Soul written and arranged. Step two, all the Rubber Soul instrumental tracks are recorded by session musicians. Step three, because the songs are already written, that means the names of the songs are known. And because the songs have been recorded by session musicians, this means that the run times of the songs are known. With that information, George Martin can now do the sequencing, which takes us to step number four. Because the sequencing has been established, then the manufacturing process for the center labels and the album jackets can begin to ensure that they are delivered by the time the Beatles finish up recording and EMI is ready to press the records. Now, the first four steps are taking place while the Beatles are doing their thing, finishing up their Christmas shows from the prior year, recording the vocals for help, filming the movie help, and doing their European and American tours. And then once they finish up the American tour, which ended on August 31st of 1965, they have that six-week period of time where they didn't write music, going back to Mark Lewison's book, which then takes them into the studio between the period of October 11th and November 11th of 1965. And that's step number five. And what the Beatles did in that 30-day period of time was to record the vocals and harmonies to the existing completed instrumental tracks. And that takes us to step number six, where the final vocals are mixed down with the previously completed instrumental tracks. So we know the Beatles finished up recording the vocals for four songs on November 11th, which actually went into the early morning hours of November 12th. Going to step number seven, with the center labels and the album jackets in-house and waiting for the pressing process to begin, the mono lacquer is cut on November 17th and then recut on the 19th due to a mastering error. Going to step number eight, the final stampers and the initial run of Rubber Soul is pressed and packaged. And remember, the center labels are adhered to the vinyl at the same time that the record is pressed. And then moving to the last step, step number nine, the initial pressings of Rubber Soul are delivered to stores in time for the Christmas season. So from October 22nd through December 3rd, this six week period of time, the final mixing of the vocals against the completed instrumental tracks is completed, the lacquer is cut, the records are pressed with the pre-ordered center labels and packaged with the pre-ordered record covers and then sent to distribution to get the records out to retail. So with that, my friends, that concludes this presentation. I hope it was informative. The comment section is open. You guys and gals have a great day and we will talk soon. Thanks for listening. More important, she is an expert at hearing the slightest imperfection on a record surface. And should she find any, a new lacquer master from the original tape is immediately ordered from New York. After audio testing, the mold goes back to the plating tanks. It produces the most important new metal part, the stamper. This completes the cycle. Lacquer to master, master to mold,
mold to stamper. The metal buildup to the stamper is exactly the same, except for one thing. The stamper is nearly all pure hard nickel. Its ridges press the playing grooves into the finished record. Now it's prepared for stamping. Ground perfectly smooth on the back. Optically center punched for the record press. Trimmed to exact diameter. And coined. Given a formed edge to grasp the stamping die securely. The record press is a complicated piece of equipment weighing two tons. It molds records by compression. Our stamper is mounted on the top die. Below it, another stamper simultaneously presses the other side of the record. The record compound, the finest pure vinyl obtainable, is fed into the press in granular form. It is forced by hydraulic pressure into a soft plastic in just the right amount for one record. The labels are pressed right into the record. Now we're ready to roll. It has taken many steps and many man hours to get here. But a new record is stamped every few seconds. The record press automatically heats the vinyl plastic for stamping, then automatically cools it so the record can be played immediately. And here's the first long play copy of Romeo and Juliet. A collector's item? No. The first pressing is always carefully inspected for everything from the correct serial number to perfect centering. Then, still another playback test. And finally, the pressing of the Romeo and Juliet gets going in earnest. And for those who prefer the 45 extended play version, and for the millions of teenagers anxiously awaiting the latest pop hit, an ingenious machine turns them out automatically. It places its own labels, feeds itself the vinyl compound, removes its own records, and stacks them already trimmed. And for the fast-growing legions of tape enthusiasts, equally ingenious machines turn out duplicate copies at four times the playback speed to save time, and backwards to save rewinding. And no matter what your taste or preference in music, in the packaging area you discover unlimited variety, the finest in sound and performance. 